Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, can I first of all say how pleased I am uh, to be here. Uh, I'm rather honoured to, to give this um, special, special talk. I must say, though, when I arrived, um, on the I went to the first talk, I think it was Jonathan Steck's talk on carp, and I sat there and I was thinking, now, I'm a virologist, what, why am I interested in carp? <laughs> am I going to be interested in fish? But immediately the talk got going, I thought, well, this is my world. This is my world. Because he had his carp, um, a volunteer carp, as it were, um, and he was doing <laughs> surgical experiments on it, putting the carp in a little box. And I thought, that's just what I do. Get my student volunteers, put them in little boxes, actually put them in little rooms, stick needles in them, you know, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and then we do the proteinomic um, analysis, genomic analysis, infect them, and so on. So I began to think right from the beginning that um, the world of experimental biology was the world, my world um, as a virologist. So I thought, in a way, well, I've been happy, very happy, to be here for these four days in your world, which is a bit like my world, but it's your world particularly. And now, for 45 minutes... I'm going to persuade you, I'm going to try and pull you into my world, which, as I've said, is not that different, but on the other hand, it is different. So I hope I can um, keep you interested and happy in my world of uh, virology. I want to say one other thing about Prague. I think it's been a wonderful four days. I think you've chosen the right city. You know, this is not Eastbourne on Sea. If you're doing a big meeting, an important meeting uh, like this is, I think, you want an important venue. And I think Prague is one of those venues. Centre of Europe, the centre of history. I mean, everything you think about, Reformation, Roman invasions, um, 100 Years' War, is Prague, 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 right at the centre of things. I looked at Madeleine Ulbrecht's book, Prague Winter, yesterday in the bookshop. She picks it up as another part of this um, history. Uh, she called it The Ides of March, 1939. Pr Prague is right in the middle of it. And I read an analysis uh, a few weeks ago, before the Greek issue came up, about the future of all of us Europeans. And they said, well, Brussels is not good enough. And I tend to agree with them. Brussels is not good enough. It hasn't got the impact. It hasn't got the great intellect as a city. It hasn't got the great architecture. It just hasn't. Built on slavery from the Congo and all this sort of thing. It's not hitting it. Um, but Prague and Vienna hits it. So the idea of this, this, this futurist was that the EU would move and it would stop all the silliness. I've been to, Pro to uh, Brussels, I know what they do. Every couple of weeks they pack into motor cars and vans and trains and move off to Luxembourg. They will move physically. How ridiculous is that? So pick a big city, a big community, and Vienna could be it, or Prague could be it. Now, obviously, the, you would, the Germans would underpin it financially. They would, work, they would work until they're 80 and slave their guts out and provide the, the cash for all of this, but they wouldn't be in charge. They would definitely not be in charge. Um, it would be either the Czechs or the Viennese or someone, and that would be the future. I mean, I'm very much in favour of the EU. I've got the, some of this work I'm, comment, I'm going to show you today. It's financed by two EU grants in Framework 7. I think they're doing very well. But I don't want to end up... I, want, I, I, want, I like it with a happy family. I think that's what it's supposed to be. I don't like the way they're treating Greece. Sorry to mention politics. You can come and complain afterwards if you like. I don't like the way they're, they're behaving in Greece. I just don't like it. That's not the way to behave, the way they're kicking a poor country around. Uh, a disadvantaged country ever since they were kicked around during the Second World War. So, you know, we, we have to get this together. Um, and I think we will get it together. And I would love to see Prague at the centre of it. And I'm jolly pleased to be here. And I'm pleased you've got your meeting here. Now, let me get down to the talk. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to... Um, I've got the introductory three or four slides. Um, uh, and I must say I've had problems with them. And when we talk about Tim Hunt and his problems, I've had three problems in my first three slides, and I'll explain what they are when we, when we get going on this. Um, and, um, uh, then, uh, but they're important slides, because they make the point that infection, and the infection I'm talking about, um, are powerful. They could be the end of all of us. The arcing power of infection, overriding. But underneath as well in this talk, and this is going to come up again and again, this power of infection, how careful we have to be. How careful we have to be. 
We must keep focused in, in this power. We must not be diverted into silliness uh, as politicians would want us to be diverted into, into biological well warfare and all that sort of nonsense. The biggest biological warfare character on this planet is Mother Nature. We will never exceed her in her capacity. We have to concentrate on what she's left us, what we're trying to deal with here, and not be diverted in any sort of way. We must not be diverted by anti-science people. There are plenty of those around, and I might even touch on that. Uh, when I get towards the end, towards the end of the talk, depending on how the chairman eyes me up about whether I'm going over time or not. <laughs> um, don't worry, I've got my eye on him. <laughs> um, and so uh, then I'm going to get you back to 1918 to look at the 1918 pandemic. Well, you'll be hearing a lot more about 1918 by the time, in, in, by the time we get to 1918. There's more of it coming up um, all the time, you know, commemorating the First World War and all this and that. I must say... I have a feeling myself, and I've done quite a lot of work with my historian, um, uh, Gill, the historian. I'm working on the science side with Jeffrey Tobenberger, who's a molecular biologist at the Institute, starting off at the Ar- Institute of the Armed Forces in the United States. And there's a story there, but I probably won't get into it today. Um, but now working at NIH. And my collaborators at the National Institute for Medical Research, particularly Rod Daniels. Um, and aided by grants from the Wellcome Trust, uh, actually. Um, So I'm going to pull you from 1918 and the world of 1918, where we think the pandemic started in France, actually. We think it was due, I think, personally, it was to do with a war. I think if it had not been for the First First World War, maybe we would not have had that pandemic. And that pandemic is the greatest outbreak of any infection that the world has ever known. If you think the bubonic plague was big, it was not as big as, as influenza 1918 to 1920. Simply because the bubonic plague, probably half of it was not bubonic plague. A lot of the figures come from a few monks sitting in, you know, this is kind of mixed figures coming from there. And then in any case, you will have an infection lasting tens of years. Here we've got an infection coming, arising just before 1918, probably 1916, um, arising new and sweeping the world in an unprecedented way. And that's what I think gives influenza its central role of the big beast one of the four big beasts of, of, of virology um, on this planet. So I'll kick into 1918, mention quarantine there, pull back through 1918, or how we're trying to look at 1918, trying to examine the virus, reconstruct the virus, um, look at the pathology uh, in, in collaboration with these other groups and other people who are involved in this work. Um, many groups are involved in this work too because they, they can now reconstruct the virus themselves and get on with it as long as they've got a high category 4 um, laboratory. And then I'll get to my own work tightly in um, with my, um, the chairman kindly mentioned Retroscreen Virology, which is a company I founded 20, 20 years ago, um, which is devoting itself to quarantine and that what new knowledge can we get from infecting volunteers um, and looking at their genome um, reactions and their proteomic patterns. Uh, can we make new discoveries? Can we make new discoveries? So that's, that's, gonna be the, that's the theme of it. Um, if I can have the li- lights a little down, you might be able to see the presentation a bit better, actually. Um, if you get... If I, tomorrow... I'm going back to London tonight. I'm going to miss your party, unfortunately. My wife particularly likes dancing, so we're quite fed up about it, but we have to get back to London. Um, if tomorrow... Um, I, I, I felt like, and I suppose I could go to, to, to um, Heathrow, get on a British Airways flight, I know the flight, it's a 12 o'clock flight, and go to Boston. I'd get a little cab into President Obama's, you know, where he studied, walk across the campus, and then I'd see this low-lying building, all white, 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 in front of me. That is the Boston Museum of Modern Art. Go into the front door, turn left, there's a white, bit, a white room, almost as big as this room, and right across the wall here is Gauguin's painting. And this is the famous, this is his last painting. This is the one he, he loved most of all his work. Um, and it's a scientific painting, a great scientific painting. Uh, I'm going to show you some other art when I go through this talk. These artists are not people who show you a tent and, and, and stick their lover's underpants on it and call it a piece of art. They are not like that. They're, they're, they're deep, deep thinkers. And I think Gauguin was a deep thinker. And you, he wants you to read this painting like a script, like a triptych. And you start off from your right. And he's asking, I've cut, unfortunately, I've cut the, the writing. There's writing on the top of this painting that he wrote on it. It was very unusual for an artist at that stage, the 1890s, to do that. But he calls the cluster of um, people up there on the right-hand side. He, he asks the great question of where have we come from? Where have we come from? 
And on the left-hand side, the question is, where are we going? Where have we come from? Where are we going? But the big question in the middle, and that's in a way, I want to, well, I'm going to concentrate through my talk on all these three aspects. The big question is, who are we? That's what that person, that character in the middle is asking. That's what he's wanting us to ask. Now, I said I've had problems with this painting. I've had problems with my friend Tarek. Tarek is a Saudi. And I remember I, was, I made my talk up for Saudi. He said, I better have a look at it. It's to do with the thought police. I mean, Saudi is a police state, and you have to be jolly careful. They pretend not to be, but they are. Um, you have to be ca- very careful with the whole setup, I realize now. And he said, Can I preview your talk? You see? And he said, What on earth is this? And I said, It's the Gauguin painting. In fact, we can't have that. You're, you're not going to show that in, Gau- in Saudi. In fact, you can't even bring it in there. He said, You could get arrested at the airport, kicked around, put in prison, tortured, and kept there for the rest of your life. Um, I'm joking a little bit, but not too much. Um, uh, he, said, he said, what you have to do, he said, what you have to do, they won't like, um, in his side, they won't like the lady over there showing her breasts, put a bit of sticky paper on it. Um, or put sticky paper on, on, on there. And I said, what about the character? And he, he said, well, it's a man. I said, I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman. It's like androgynous. Oh, my God. I don't know what to do. You'd have to cover him up altogether. And then, and then there's a goddess. A goddess being shown in Saudi. Well, you have to cover her up with a brown paper. So in the end, you can see um, his wonderful painting could not be shown in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I think there are other places as well. But it's a wonderful painting. And I'll probably, I'm going to refer to it right at the end because we have created a window. Um, we're using the Gauguin painting um, as a basis for that window. We call it the pandemic flu window. So the power of infection... That every infection except for two that was around that Gauguin knew in the 1890s are still with us. And that's the misconception uh, probably of people walking along Wednesday the Square. They think it's all over. They think antibiotics came in the 40s and it's all finished. Uh, well, we've got news for them. And there's only two infections that have been eradicated since that time. One's smallpox, you will know about, and one's rinderpest that you should know about better than me. Rinderpest, an infection, a terrible infection of cattle, a crippling infection for an economy, if you have rinderpest. That was eradicated two years ago by vaccination. Those are the only two. Everything else is just the same as it was in Gauguin's time. And that's why we look back. Where have we come from? We've come from a world of infection. Where are we going? Well, we're going into a world of infection. And since there's so many more of us, things are going to get worse, I think, rather than better. And that's, how, that's why we have to concentrate. I use this slide a lot. I love this slide. Um, it's a 1922 Atlas, Times Atlas slide. And you can see a globe, and you can see uh, what's in the middle of the globe. Well, England is in the middle of the globe. And I made a mistake um, at, at this place, Chatham House. Yes, I remember. I remember the date. It was 2003. Um, and um, I, I was doing my little bit. I came up with my globe, and I said, well, there's England in the middle. I said, well, other countries. I said, other, a lot of other countries not even on this map, but it doesn't matter because they're piddling little places, like the United States, for example. I said, it's a piddling little place in, in 1920. It really was, compared to the power of the British Empire. But well, we came to coffee time, and up, to, up came to this very nice man. He said, excuse me, very American. He said, excuse me. He was the Amer- assistant to the American ambassador. He said, the American ambassador's in the audience. He's most upset with your comments, uh, calling the United States a piddling little place. He said, we are on a crusade together. We are on a crusade together. This is the time of the Iraq. And he said, that we don't want partners like you. We don't want people like you making negative comments about the United States. Well, I said, well, it's a bit too bad, really, but you were a piddling power in 1922. <laughs> um, you may not be now, but that's what you were, and that's what I'm talking about. So you have to be careful, don't you, with your audience. And then, um, but this is the global nature. I mean, now... We're talking Africa's on this thing. We're talking about MERS, you know, West Africa here, the power of infection in MERS. And I think we, and at the moment, um, the, 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 um, sorry, the Ebola, in, in the moment we're also uh, talking about the power of infections from the Middle East, from Saudi, actually. Um, and it, a, a difficult, it's difficult in a society like that to get anywhere with it. Although they're helping, things are considered very private, and you, so you can't even ask people what they have for breakfast. It kind of it impinges on their privacy. It's very difficult to work it out. But those infections began... Mers has been a thousand people have had it. Four, surely 400 have died in Saudi. But it's when it emerges to other countries do, does it cause a stir. And recently it's emerged to Korea. Um, and all the things... You don't have to have many cases these days of some of these infections to cause an uproar. 
You know, you soon see pictures of people running around in masks, closing schools, stopping the airport, and so on and so forth. And actually, Ebola was not so much different. A pretty small contained infection, really, um, compared to other things in Africa, and the whole world is in uproar about it. So things are very global now, in a, and I think in a surprising way, and that's why I still like uh, to show this picture. And then finally, for this introduction, in a way, he's at the centre of it. He's at the centre of it. He's a survivor, survived from 1920. He survived the great pandemic. And you could start asking questions. Why did he... He could ask some questions. Why did I survive? My friend didn't. What's different about me? Is it genes? You know, is it the way I behave? You know, why? I mean, this came up as well in your wonderful talks, behaviour of, of, um, of animals, you know, shy fish and bold fish and so on. Um, but the same here. What, what, what makes the difference? And when I showed this picture, I used it for the first time. You know, he's got, what, 20,000 genes in action, 20,000 genes, but a small virus, there's 10,000 of them sitting on a pinhead, can get him into his bed and kill him, and it, as it did 50 million people in 1918. So what's the basis of all this, and why did he survive? Well, this is all very well, but when I showed this slide to the student, um, I did comment on the size of the fig leaf. It was the bad thing to do, I can tell you. And I said to them, jokingly, well, you can come up to me afterwards and you want to know about the fig leaf. And three of them did. And they were medical, three, they were, they were medical students and, um, and in their 20s. And one of them was, and said, well, what's behind the fig leaf? And I said, well, come on, you're joking. Go and sort it out yourself. And the other two reported me to the dean. And, um, and I, I had this very serious letter saying they were very upset about a disturbing picture that you showed them and the man with the big fig leaf. And um, I said, for God's sake, you know, kick them out. And he said, no, no, no. The parents will start coming in. They'll bring in the mum, just like we heard about the mum going to an interview yesterday or the day before. They'll bring the mum in and she'll cause havoc. So what you should do is give them a copy of your book. In fact, give them two copies. And I said, well, they're 25 pounds each, my, my book. Why should I invest 50 pounds in these two? He said, well, please do on, on the help me, help the medics, otherwise we'll be in trouble. So I did. But um, it's just show how much trouble you can get with a fig leaf. Yeah, really. And in 2009, I was sitting at the King's Cross station. I remember it perfectly. I had a message from, Professor, from uh, uh, Mr. Obama. This is it. I must admit, it came in the Guardian newspaper for me, so it was a fairly indirect message. For too long, <laughs> for too long, we placed at the top of our pinnacle those folks who can manipulate numbers and engage in complex financial calculations. We heard that from our previous speaker yesterday. These people are fiddling the books and bankers and all that lot. But what we really need are more science, more engineers, more building and creating things. And that's my subtext. Obama's given me my subtext. That's really what my talk is about, in essence. Not just academic things, but what can we do about it? What contribution can we make? And I think you're into that as well. So, 1918, what's the lesson? Well, it's their start. We will be commemorating 2018, but we could have a pandemic by then. Everyone's very satisfied that we've, in a sense, we've had one in 2009. They're all relaxing. They're all getting on with other things, you know, bombing of the Yemen and things like that. Um, but you, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful indeed. And I think in 1916, I'll show you briefly anyway, what was happening in 1916. Influenza was moving around in 1916. I think the pre-pandemic was moving around. And the 100, 145 deaths. But within two years, I think it really got going, there's 50 million deaths. So there's not, you have to be pretty careful of a virus that can go from 145 to 50 million. That's my point on that. Let me touch 1918, and I want to say to you that there's no question of them not taking it seriously. No question at all. They threw everything at that infection. They didn't even know, they didn't know it was a virus. They didn't know what it was. All they knew was people were dying in quite large numbers. But they threw everything they had at it. They threw themselves at it. The nurses and doctors and the helpers and the scientists threw themselves at it, and they died at that moment trying to do that. This is an American picture of troops coming in and being, being hospitalised, infected on the troop ships coming in. But that's a sort of um, uh, protective barrier, which is not bad. Those sheets were soaked in disinfectant. The, 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 the masks were, were special cotton uh, soaked in disinfectant, big gowns, gloves and so on. Dis social distancing, all those things we know now are important. They didn't have vaccines, so they, although they already began a, a single vaccine against pneumococcus, which in, a, in fact turned out to be rather important. 
Um, but even at that moment, when people were dying in very large numbers, they got volunteers. And the Americans got some volunteers from the Navy. I do believe they're volunteers. I don't believe it was you, 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 and you. And they got six volunteers. They put them on an island in Boston Harbor, and they tried to infect them. They tried to infect them with throat washings from their compatriots who were dying, and they, 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 they tried to infect them with um, bronchial washings and even ground up lungs, but they didn't get one of those volunteers infected. Now, you can thank your lucky stars for that. The first quarantine experiment done, to my knowledge, with influenza, they couldn't get one of them infected. I suspect what had happened was there'd been a, there, we know there'd been a previous wave before the autumn of 1918, in the summer, that summer, particularly in the navies um, of the British Navy, particularly. And I suspect myself that those volunteers, unknowing, I don't think, unknowing to them, they had been infected already, recovered, and so they were immune. And so I, you can thank your lucky stars. It would have been a very bad start, I think, to quarantine experiments that they'd all died, which they could have done in an experiment um, of that nature. Now, I've mentioned 1916... And I'll tell you why I've, I've mentioned it. Um, I want to push you to the Western Front because we've got evidence that my, my Douglas Gill, the historian, and my team in general have got, uh, I mean, Seth, who's a medical microbiologist, and myself and two others. Um, we looked at it, particularly Douglas, who's looked at the, who understands the British Army. He's looked at a British Army camp um, uh, at a Tapla on the Western Front. It's going to become more prominent because the, the, Amer- the French government just agreed to do archaeology there, to dig up this camp and, and, and open it up. Uh, this camp is not like a holiday camp. It's not like the Butlin's holiday camp or a Boy Scout camp. It's not like that. Every day, they never knew how many were there, how many soldiers were there. A minimum of 100,000 soldiers were there uh, on, on an average. Uh, they were trained up and sorted out. They came from England, trained up and sorted out, up on the railway line. Vera Britton, I'll show one of her poems in there. Vera Britton wrote a poem about it. She wrote a lot of poems about it, working as a VAD in the hospital there. It's up the line. It's called up the line. Um, and they all wave gaily, and they're up the line, and most of them dead within, within six months. Uh, and back they come wounded and crippled, and then they get shipped back to England via a tapler. A tapler tries to sort them. One of the famous, Sassoon, the famous poet, he viewed it like a pig's farm, um, this place, the way people were treated on, on this. I think people did their best. I'm not saying that. The army did its best, the medical people did their best, but they're overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. And on some nights in a Tapla, you can go there and see the railway station. There was a railway line coming in. They'd have, they'd have 20 trains at night come in from the Western Front, each of them with a 1,000 wounded soldiers on 20,000 wounded soldiers coming in. one. Ten of those wounded soldiers would occupy my own hospital, the Royal London, a 500 bed. Ten of them would cripple the hospital if they were being looked after properly. And they would have um, that tens of thousands coming in in one great push. This is the scenario. The scenario is that those young people, um, teenagers, most of them, sat in that that line there, that's the Western Front going all the way to Switzerland. The British sector was 50 miles by 10 miles. 10 miles wide, 50 miles. Two million young people would spend five days up the front on that line and then would be pulled back into the back areas um, for a few days. And they, it was a kind of a 12 day circuit. Four days here, four days there, four days there. Um, but of course, it was the overcrowding that uh, led to problems. Um, and that's where um, I want to uh, bring in Vera Britton. Overcrowding in those camps, all the things that you don't want when you're talking about infection. Overcrowding, poor hygiene, you know, in general, especially living in, in pig holes on the, on, on, on the Western Front itself. Um, but I now want to... Let, let me just give you an example of it. You know, I can, I can go on about what it was like, but I think um, I want to... I wanna, I wanna, push you into two aspects, two, two aspects of it. Vera Britton, she, people know more about her now. When I first started working on a tapla as a, as a fermenter, as a beginning place for the great pandemic in 1916, which then mutated and then by 1918 took off, that's what we're saying, uh, the army person I contacted at the Royal Army Medical Corps, he said, look, read Brit- Vera Britton's book, Testament of Youth. And it's been filmed recently. 
It was a disgraceful film, actually, when, when, you, when I come to think of it. But she volunteered. Vera Britton, that's, that's at the heart of this. She didn't know anything about nursing. She volunteered. She was a student. She volunteered because her fiancé had volunteered. And her fiancé volunteered because her, Vera Britton's brother, who was his best friend, volunteered. So off they went to the Western Front. And Vera thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stick around at, at university. I'm, I'm going to volunteer as well. She gets to Etapla. That's where she was. She, we know everything about her. She was at Hospital 24. And there were, that gives you an idea of what was going on there. 24 hospitals, number 24. How many hospitals were there? Well, they were all up that coastline. If you're going to deal with 40,000 wounded soldiers and all that, you need a lot of hospital nursing and medical care. She'd been there for six months. She came home. They led her home. I mean, she's a volunteer. She could leave any time, but she did not. She came home at Christmas, and she'd arranged at Christmas to meet her fiancé. Now, this is Edwardian Britain. This is Edward in Britain. And that Christmas, she says she, w- she wanted to have his baby. This is Edward in. This is not 2000. This is not 2015. We're talking about 1916 here, 1915 here. Uh, she gets a telephone call. She was staying with her mother and parents. She gets a telephone call. It's, it's her fiancé. She picks up the line. Oh, it's the home. It's the, it's the war office. Your fiancé has been killed on, on a frontal attack. He's dead. She gets back. She doesn't pack them in. She goes back to the Western Front. She goes back to Etapla and continues her nursing. Within, I think, three, three weeks, four weeks, another telegram arrives. It's her brother. He's been killed. And just at that moment, the, the senior nurse, and I, I, we, know, we know about her, comes to Vera Britain, and she says, Britain, I want you to work on Ward 22. That's the German ward. So her brother's been killed, um, her fiance has been killed, and now I want you to work on the German ward. Now, this, we've had lots of discussion, um, and I'm very pleased to be part of it, about the role of women scientists um, and, and so on. This is an exemplary, and so is the next woman I'm going to bring into this, exemplary thing of duty and honour from that period. She could have said, I'm, I've had enough of it. I'm going home. But she didn't. And she continued to work on that German ward, and she wrote this poem. Uh, it's a longer poem, this, but I'm just going to read a little bit of it. I'll read it because you're not going to see it from the front. But it's a very important poem, I think, which brings up how these women behaved at that time. Um, and I think we can learn something from it. And there's three, three verses. The first poem just, 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 just gives you a feel of what it's like. But the crucial poem, the crucial bit comes in the second verse. So in the first verse, it's, when the, when the years of strife are over and my recollection fades of the wards wherein I, where the where I work the weeks away, I still, shall still see as a vision rising amid the wartime shades, the ward in France where the German wounded lay. And I learnt that human mercy turns, turns alike to friend or foe when the dark hour of all is creeping nigh. And those who slew, slew our dearest, when, they're our, when their lamps were burning low, found help and pity ere they came to die. So though much will be forgotten when the sound of war's alarms and the days of death and strife have passed away, I shall always remember the vision of love working amidst arms in the ward where the, where the wounded prisoners lay. And the, 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 the nurse in charge would say to Vera Britton, go and look after that hun. Go and look after that hun. But what she really meant was, go and look after that 18-year-old. And Vera Britton's assuring those young Germans, that she would look after them. Though they may have killed her brother, she would look after them as their time approaches. She would do that, and that was her duty to do it. So with that in the background, we set out on this quest to kind of get this virus, and she was so much involved in it. Not only the wounded soldiers, but by 1917, the six soldiers coming in, by 1918, they were getting overwhelmed with the number of soldiers ill with the flu. So several expeditions, because of the PCR, molecular genetics, um, suddenly it occurred to everyone that one could recreate, one could get, recreate that virus from 1918 if we could get our hands on the sample. And so at that stage, I joined an expedition to Spitsbergen. It's a very international expedition. I'm not going to go into it. These international expeditions, I did learn, are very fragmentary affairs. And it's you know, very, very difficult. 
Um, but this just shows my, my colleague, Rod Daniels, who's the, who's the character in the background there. The seven coal miners who we knew died of flu and were buried on Spitsbergen in permafrost. We want to know how deep they are. We want to know whether they're in single graves or in a mass grave. You know, what's happening below? Because it's quite difficult. It's like concrete permafrost. It's like coming along trying to dig up this floor. It is just like that. Um, and there's me lurking around on the right-hand side. Now, I'm holding a laptop. The temperature's minus 20 degrees centigrade. There's no snow. It's like, it's like the Sahara Desert, uh, Spitsbergen. Um, it's only 700 miles from the North Pole. Um, but there we are. So Ron's got the penetrating around, sending a signal down to the ground, and it's being picked up by my laptop, and every time he shouts F, I have to press the F button. Well, of course, I've got great big gloves on, because it is minus 20. And... Uh, Rod shouts, press the F button, and soon he's shouting, press the effing F, F button. <laughs> and then it soon gets into, you effing professor, F, press the F button, you effing, effing, effing. I'm sorry about all this, but um, that's, that's how it went. But we did get through it. We did get through it. And we realized there was a mass grave um, down below going down to 15 feet. And it was, we know, we reconstructed it. They, those coal miners, all of them healthy, all of them young, all of them Norwegian, volunteered two years so they could earn enough money to come back and marry their fiancé. On the, on, you know, it's poverty. Work there, earn the money, get back home. And on the ship, there were 70 of them on the ship, and these seven died. It's about 10% fatality. That's pretty normal. And there they were. Their friends didn't know what to do, uh, uh, but they decided to blast open the permafrost. Not blast it open, but open it, loosen it with dynamite, which they had plenty of dynamite. They went down. One of them must have taken a bucket and went down to the sea. Now, that's minus 20 degrees that day when they were buried in October 1918. Minus 20 degrees. Get a bucket of sand, bring it back, and when they got their comrades, their friends buried them side by side in their wooden coffins in the permafrost, um, sprinkled the sand across the top. And we realized this when we started digging. Now, I'm not a professional digger, and I'll show you what it means to be doing exhumation in a moment, but it basically does mean digging down. And I was helping because we knew they were 15 feet. And so I was just helping a couple of them. I think my wife was. We were all at it that day. And we got down to about two feet, um, and suddenly there was sand and I said to the exhumer, what does this mean? He said, look, you're, you're going to hit the coffins. You're going to hit the coffins. He knew what was happening. And, and we did. But then, then it turned out they were not in the permafrost. They were in the active layer. 80 years from 4 degrees to minus 20. 4 degrees to minus 20. So when we found them, they were stripped naked. They were, they were skeletal. Their legs were tied with rope, and they were wrapped in newspaper from December 1918. But we got them in the end. But when we were there, um, the exhumer said, why are you going to all this bother of looking for permafrost? Like, we, he knew why, scientifically, we were trying to do it, to get the samples. But he said, you can do it in an easier way. What about going for a lead coffin? Um, people can be very well preserved in lead coffins. You may have seen recently the Swede, the, the bishop who's in a lead coffin from about 400 years, I think, is in very good condition when you cut the lead off. He said, why don't you go for people? And so we did. And I'm going to cut a long story short here, but we went for this, this woman... And, and her, her, one of her relatives came forward. Phyllis Burns, her name was. In a way, she's like Vera Britton. Her parents wanted her to marry someone, got it all stitched up, and she turfed out. I mean, it was the time of the suffragette movement. And Phyllis said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to be a VAD, voluntary nurse. I'm going to be into science. I'm going to be into nursing. And, and Phyllis Burns could drive a car she, and so she could get, drive an ambulance. That's what she could do. And she did it. And we know she did it at Tarpla. So there's a converging story here. Um, I don't know if they ever met those two. My father was in the Royal Naval Air Force, not so far from Etapla. Etapla was at the centre of, of, of things. Um, so she, Phyllis Burns worked herself out during that. She didn't come back. Although she could have come back at any moment, but she didn't. She came back in the armistice, like my father came back. They either came back to Charing Cross or they came back to Waterloo. She came from, to Charing Cross. As she got there, she realized she had aches and pains in the back. She had a cough, tightness across the chest. She realized she had Spanish flu. She'd been nursing soldiers with Spanish flu, and she realized she had it. Now, what did Phyllis do next? She didn't go home. She did not go home to her mother in Twickenham, in Strawberry Hill. 
because she thought she'd transfer the infection. So to protect her mother, she rented a little flat and battled it out, and she did not survive. And so we got her death certificate um, showing double pneumonia, influenza double pneumonia, local doctor and a stranger had, 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 was, was a witness. So for this, but the, the, the family gave permission for the exhumation. When I went to see them, they were in a castle, the family. When I we went to see them, they had a, the only picture for this is one I've just shown you. It was the size of a postage stamp. That's the only memory that family had of Phyllis, apart from the stories. A postage stamp photograph that was on the mantelpiece. And they said that they knew Phyllis. They knew how she volunteered. They knew all about her. And if she was there in the room, if she was there and we could ask her, she'd agree to this exhumation. So there you are. And that's how we exhumed Phyllis Burns. Um, and I just te- briefly touch on this exhumation. I think I'm just about enough time. People ask me at this meeting, how do you, how you do an exhumation? Well, I'm not an exhumer. I'm, this is an exhumer, a professional exhumer. You need them. You can't just be digging around yourself. You just can't. This is the exhumation of Sir Mark Sykes. You may have um, heard of Mark Sykes. He's on the Sykes-Chico line. It's all come up recently with ISIS. You know, why is the Middle East divided like a textbook? Well, because Mark Sykes and Chico went there and had a school textbook and put a line down it, and we'll call this Iraq, we'll call this something else. That's why it's like it is. So it's probably going to have to readjust it now. But he went to the... He was a lord. He took an army, the last private army, to the Western Front. Um, and he... All, they all came back. All his army, little army of 100 men, came back because he insisted they did the thing they knew. That's horses. Not wasted, not have been ch- channeled up churned up and, and, and by the, all this fighting. But they looked after the horses. Is why they were at the Versailles Peace Conference, 1919, the infection, the second wave came in and his wife got it. Now, he could have said, well, hang on, I'm a lord, I'm an MP, I've got my own estate and all this, I'll, I'll employ 10 doctors and 15 nurses and carry on with Versailles. But he didn't, you see. He helped out. And he caught the infection and he died and she survived. And in a way, it, and what I'm saying to you, I think, well, I know I am, um, we're, we're back to the great painting of Goga. We're back to the androgynous character in the middle, and he's saying, who are we? And I'm saying to you that sometimes we don't know who we are until we're confronted. Um, when Vera Britton was confronted, when Phyllis was confronted, and that decision at Charing Cross, and he was confronted here, and he took that decision. And sometimes it brings out the best in people. I think normally it does. Um, and in, uh, again and again, we're finding this with this great pandemic. People were confronted, and that's why I've come on in a moment um, to my window where we're commemorating all these people in, in, a, in a form of a pandemic window. It's a memorial window, not for the British Army, not for the French Army, but for people who battled it out in their homes in England and around the world, and they took these decisions. With Sir Mark Sykes, this is an exclamation. Um, there's an example again. You know, we start, we, we were all prepared. He had his own church, his own estate, you know. But it does so happen his wife was buried on top of them. Sixteen members of the family, all Catholic, gave permission for exclamation here. Um, and that's not easy, I don't think, if you're, if you're rather religious in the Catholic way. Um, they did give permission. And when we realized his wife was buried on top of him, she died 15, 20 years later. And we had to go... Th- back again and ask them for permission to exhume her, to move her out of the way. And this is, this is the sort of situation you get into. So we've, we're halfway through. She's been moved, the remains of the coffin have been moved to sideways, and we're now we're after Mark Sykes, um, who's down deep here in his, in his leg coffin. When you're dealing with this, if you're dealing with 1918, you're not treating it lightly. I mean, 50 million people dying, but if you're exhuming from someone even a leg coffin, we aren't expecting to find them in good, in good condition. So Sir so Colin Berry is a morbid anatomist. There he is in a Cat 3 outfit. As much protection as we give. It's a bit like the Ebola, protection but more. This is a better protection than those nurses and doctors had with Ebola. This has got a HEPA filter at the back, pulling air through, filtering it, pushing it up through and out again. Um, my daughter's, one of my daughters, a filmmaker, is filming from the left-hand side. Just to give you an example here of the, of the difficulty in this sort of thing, um, uh, just at this moment, and these exhumations normally get started at 2 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, because um, we don't want people around. And the man next to me, Sir Tatton Sykes, he said, could we 
could you ask um, the Mormon nationalists to have a look in the gravesite and see if there's a medal there that was given by the Tsar? And I said, well, of course I can. He's down there. He's, you know, we got permission to remove the heart, lung, spleen. But the man next to me, he said, hang on a minute. Have you got permission to remove a medal? And I said, well, we've got permission to remove everything else. He said, yes, I know. But have you got permission to remove I said, well, as a matter of fact, no. He said, well, if, if you get permission from the home office, and this is 2 o'clock in the morning, if you get written permission from the home office by 8 o'clock, if you get written permission from the health and safety, if you get written permission from the bishop, you can do it, otherwise you're not going to. Um, so we didn't. So we got, asked, we got some samples of everything else, but not the great cross of the bazaar. So you had to be very, very careful during the exhumation. This is what we're after. This woman was 200 years in her lead coffin. 200 years in her lead coffin. Um, she had blue eyes, um, perfect, you know, not preserved. She had not been preserved. You, you, she must have been, you must have reached anaerobic, you must have been not an anaerobic situation, not an aerobic, but something in between, and stasis. So that's, that's the situation. But most of the information, I must say, um, we're getting from this sort of sample, um, sort of lung sample, preserved in the great museums, and this one at the museum at St. Barnes. And with the first paper we published on this in Nature, John Scale that was at the centre of this, we did X-ray crystallographic studies um, of the hemagglutinin that we and others had reconstructed, um, one of the main proteins of influenza, using the, um, using the data, uh, in fact, not from the exhumations, but from the uh, little bit of tissue I just showed you from the museum. And Tobenberger in the United States, he did use a piece of tissue from an exhumation that he, they, took, they got in Alaska from a group of Inuit. So that meant the material became available and you could do x-ray crystallographic studies. You could look at, at that time, we were particularly interested in the three viruses, H1, which was in 1918, H5, the bird flu, and a more common H3. And we're looking at the receptor binding site of those three viruses. I'm not going to go into the details here. You have to be an aficionado of influenza to be particularly interested in this. But a receptor binding site enables a virus to stick on things. So if an avian influenza has the, the rece right receptor binding site, it'll stick on you, on your upper airways, and infect you. And we found that... The, in essence, that the 1918 ones resembled the bird flu one, resembled the bird flu one, which was kind of not good news and still is not good news. With that in the background, um, the 1918, um, and you, you, you obviously you can't do experiments in the 1918, although the virus has been reconstructed by the groups by groups in the United States um, to look at. It. Obviously, all you can do is animal work, but we pushed ahead to take up the knowledge base of influenza and to use quarantine. Um, these volunteers are just after the Second World War, that's why the character's there in his army outfit, um, and they're going to the common cold unit, Harvard Hospital. There's an aerial picture here, just outside Salisbury. And there's Dr. Tyrrell in charge. There's been a lot of discussion at this meeting um, about laboratories and jobs. And I'll tell you one thing for free. Um, young people, you want to be clear of where you are going. That's one thing I would say. Labs are very different. They're like people. They have different attitudes, different atmosphere. And just to give you an example, David's a very nice character, but he was very religious. And working in that common cold unit, they used to have, used to have Bible classes. Um, I'm not religious at all. And he offered me a job. And when I, thought, when I realized he was religious, I, I, I kind of moved myself aside. But I, I thought I, could not, I, I wouldn't get on there. So you do, you do have to consider that. Are you going to fit in you know, with, with, the, with the lab? The science can be good, but if you don't fit in, it's going to be a bit of a problem. But I liked David. I liked David very much, but I just wouldn't want to work there. No, I did work there for short periods of time. There it is. This is a common cold infecting volunteers. Here they are. This is 1980s now. The old furniture, the unit, and everything else. And here's my family picture which I love to show. Um, I'm not really showing it because of my family. I'm showing it because of the building in the background. It's a volunteer unit it's from the Harvard Hospital in the Second World War. But that's my uncle there and my youngest daughter, Juliet. And um, I was talking um, to someone yesterday about, about her because of a nice little baby's here. But we took her down to this unit where I was working. I was working at the Common Cold Unit. Um, so that's, that's Juliet when she was about six months. And now... Um, um, uh, we published together, so that must have been 25 years ago. 
I would say this. So this, this paper is Oxford and Oxford. So that's my daughter, Juliet. It's not easy to publish with your daughter. Let me, let me give you a warning on this. I mean, she, we, we wrote this together, and she said, Dad, I don't think your writing quality is very good. You say, and I said, well, I've written 300 papers. She said, I don't mind whether you've written 300 papers or not. Um, you, you've got to improve your writing skills. So, you know, my goodness. Um, uh, but anyway, he came up with this paper, very nice paper. I think it's quite a nice one. Clinical scientific and ethnographic studies of influenza. And she's the she's a medi- she was a medical student, but she took time off to study ethnology. And ethnology is like is, is like uh, anthropology, but you you do the experiment yourself. You carry out the study. So she went into the unit and tried to work out what the why the volunteers, why people volunteered. Strangely enough, they volunteered for cash. We pay them £3,000 to volunteer. So if any of you feel like volunteering, we're always looking out for volunteers. 3000 sometimes £4,000. All you have to do is come along and live in luxury for a week and have us prodding you around. Um, but she did find by the end of the, t- of the study that these, these volunteers, who are not usually students actually, um, were much interested in the science and medical things and became a more, um, um, less interested in the cash for the cash's sake. So it's quite a little change in their attitude. Volunteers are very important. They're at the essence of this. The, the man, this is a Soviet um, post-impressionist painting. Uh, it's called The Returning Hero, or The return, return, Returning War Hero. Um, and there he is, the war hero, with his medals and his, do- and his granddaughter. He is too old to volunteer. She is too young. That I sometimes portray as my perfect volunteer, until someone complained to me. So there's another picture where people complain. They said, she's a pro-abortionist. This is taken on a... On a this is a very classic American picture, but it's taken on a, on, a, on, a, on a demonstration pro-abortion. So I mean, you, never get, you never get away from it. Does anyone like to lodge a complaint? She's the chairman afterwards. But she's, she's the perfect volunteer, young, active, intelligent. That's exactly what... That age we want. We don't want them too young. Otherwise, they mess around. And there we are. There we are. This, this, is the, this, this, is, this is a modern quarantine unit. These um, students, there's a, a lot of staff involved. And let me, let me tell you, for a group of 25 volunteers, we normally start off with 10,000. 10,000. We've got a team of 200 people working on this. And 20 of them spend nothing else, who do nothing else other than telephone around Britain for volunteers. And all those 10,000, 5,000 are no good. I mean, they're lovely people, but they drink... Um, they take class A drugs, um, you know, all that sort of thing. Can't, you know, can't have them. And, and gradually you whittle it down. Um, they, you know, we get hundreds of coming in. We have you know, medical staff, scientific staff, nursing staff to look after them and examine them. And in the end, we whittle it down to 25. So you can see it's, it's pretty expensive work. And a clinical trial costs about a million pounds. In fact, now it's about two million pounds um, uh, to do this sort of work. Let me, give a, let me give two examples of what we're doing. Uh, we want to see if we can make a universal flu vaccine. Not be content, if you remember the structure of influenza, like a football with spikes sticking out. But every year you have to change the vaccine because you, you make the vaccine according to the outside spike. And that's the one that changes most of all. But there are internal proteins which don't change. So could we make a vaccine against the internal proteins? It's a big question. That would be a universal one. I mean, last year the vaccine didn't match up to the, to the strain circulating, because every year they change. So what we did in this experiment, we took each one of those as a separate volunteer across here, and all these different colours um, are... They're, they're, what we've done is we've taken their protein genome. Uh, we've taken influenza, the 11 proteins of influenza, and we've, we've, we've split it up, as it were, um, into peptides, 18 MERS, 18 amino acids in each peptide, overlapping peptides covering the entire protein genome of influenza virus. And then we've taken cells. That's the thing with volunteers. You wash the noses out, take loads of blood from them four times a day, do their temperatures, do everything. They're under your control, as it were. Um, I mean, very nicely way. Um, very high-quality medical attention, very high-quality nursing attention in them. It was almost like one-to-one. So we get all the samples we like. And so that's pre-infection at the top there. They're background immunity, if you like, the background cells. Those are um, reactivity to CD4 cells that are circulating. It's a cellular immunity background. After we've infected them, that's the bottom here, you see every one of them, I think it was doing about 
There's two of them didn't get infected. Um, but you, and that's usually the case because um, we screen them through. They haven't got any antibody, otherwise we couldn't infect them. But they do have some of these CD4 cells lurking around, as you can see from the top beforehand. Afterwards, they've all got plenty of CD4 cells reacting across the protein dome. But is there any correlation between the pre-existing CD4s and immunity for this so-called um, universal flu vaccine? If you look at the right-hand side, those three graphs, um, they show CD4 cells. They've got total T cells on the left. The CD4 cells are what we're after here. And those are CD4 cells which are reacting with the, nu- the internal proteins, nuclear protein and matrix. And what we've done here is we've correlated, for these volunteers, um, the, um, the number of CD4 cells, that's the, that's the number on the, on the bottom line here, 200, 400, 600, 800, and up the other going up the vertical uh, axis, as it were, we've either got, at the top there, we've either got um, virus shedding, that's on the top graph, the right-hand one, um, or we've got the middle one, we've got total symptom score, and at the bottom, we've got illness duration. And whether you can see it or not, uh, we published this in Nature about two years ago now, Um, it's a very important paper from our point of view, the more... CD4 cells reacting to nuclear protein and matrix that you have, the fewer symptoms you get and the less virus you excrete. So what you want are CD4 cells. Um, am I doing something wrong here? Okay, I hope I've not spent 40 minutes talking to myself here. <laughs> um, possible, it is possible. Um, <laughs> uh, so what you want are CD4 cells, um, uh, immune CD4 cells that react to nuclear protein and matrix, the internal proteins. And if you've got those, um, they will give you some protection. Um, the, the chairman's warning me I've got 10 minutes. I'm keeping an eye on everyone here. Anyone else like to come up to the front? <laughs> um, so, um, and then what we do is we say, well, hang on, we can, you know, we, we've got overlapping peptides. Um, So we can identify which peptides then react with these CD4 cells. Uh, And then we say, well, we'll we'll go a step further. Those are the peptides, in a sense, that we think are correlated with immunity. That's why they didn't get the, didn't get, they got less virus, uh, they got fewer symptoms and so on. So we'll make a vaccine. uh, And we'll make it with those peptides. We'll just formulate those peptides. And this will be the universal flu vaccine in the future. And that's what we're up to. I can't give you the results. We've just, the, with the EU grants, the two lovely EU grants, uh, we're planning, we have planned a big clinical trial in Europe. I think actually there's a big clinic here in, in Prague, come to think of it, involved in the scene. So we will do, we've done, we've done experiments in the, not with this universal flu vaccine, but with two others in our unit. Um, but this will be our own uh, so-called universal flu vaccine. And if it works, it will mean that you will not need to change the formulation each year, which is a big job, which is a big job. Um, and sometimes you get the mismatch, as we had this last year. So I'm very pleased with this sort of approach. And that will continue. Uh, but what particularly we're interested in um, is looking at proteinome, looking at the genome of people, inf- those volunteers infected um, with influenza. And if you look at the top, here right at the top, you've got... The, those are individuals on the left-hand side in those curves. Those are individuals there... And, and they show, you show the symptom score. So for each individual, you see, uh, and this is where the tricky thing is, in 25 hours, between 25 and, 30 and, and 50 uh, hours after infection, they begin to get the symptoms, varying symptoms of, of common cold, not, not the deep symptoms of Phyllis Burns, not tightness across the chest. We don't want to kill anyone. Um, but this is the, the more superficial infections of influenza in those volunteers. And then in the middle here, um, we've looked at genome, expression of different genes, and we've looked at 5,000. Um, in fact, we looked at more than that. We are finding that it, after infection with influenza, 5,000, that's what the essence of the story is, 5,000 human genes are, are, are undergo switching up or switching down. Switching up, switching down. Um, in this particular case, in the symptomatic volunteers, because though they all got in infected and, and you, you know, you're some of them some of them were asymptomatic so we had two groups here uh, and then you can begin to look I mean you begin to look there the genes being switched on in curve B 
Um, and they are in, I know it gets a bit complicated if I get into the full analysis here, but at the top there shows the correlation of those gene clusters, those different eight gene clusters with symptomatology. And the important gene clusters are three and four. And um, it's those that correlate with symptomatology, and that's what we're picking up in that middle curve. If we analyze the uh, the genes of those volunteers who didn't show any, who didn't show any symptoms, they're, they're flat on the, ba- on the base here. So immediately we're beginning to pick up between the symptoms, symptomatolo- those volunteers with symptoms and those without, genes, differential expression of genes. So we've got everything now. We've got, we've got some genes that are during infection, and they're, they're not... It's just to complicate matters. The, the, you won't be able to see it from the back, but the, the distance here is different from the one at the top. So what we are finding um, is that the genes begin to be switched on and off way before the symptoms start occurring in any case. So very early response of the human genome to infection. It did surprise us. It did surprise us. But that's what we're endeavouring to work with over the next, over the next decade, um, really. So let me bring this together. Um, this is a post-impression Soviet painting again. It's called, it's just right for what I want. It's called A Little Piece of Paradise on Earth. A Little Piece of Paradise on Earth. And why not? This was painted in 1956. The Great War has finished. You know, there's, it is a paradise. It's a young mum with her child looking forward to spring and the future. But, there's always a but, isn't there? Only a year away, unbeknown to her, unbeknown to any of us, a great pandemic was stirring, an influenza pandemic, not H1N1, not the Spanish flu, but what we call the Asian flu. Five million people died. Not 50 million, but five. But five is not an, an easy number to deal with. So she was very vulnerable, wasn't she? And her child, a year later, would have been very vulnerable. And I wish now I knew more about her and about the child. I wish I knew what happened. Did she survive? Did the child survive? Did they have a vaccine? And I think the answer is no. Because they're very difficult. You can't make these flu vaccines as they stand at the moment. But of course, with a universal flu vaccine, if you could persuade mums to use them, um, and there's a big if there sometimes, a universal flu vaccine, children can be vaccinated with a universal vaccine, which would cover new pandemic strains emerging. And that, again, I think, shows deeply why we're so interested in this. And then my penultimate thing here, I'm going back to Goga. We opened a window, the church, this, the, the, the medical library at the Royal London Hospital medical library is in the church. The church ran out of congregation as more and more Somalis came there and became Islamic and all this and that. No one wanted, no, there were no, one, no, one, no congregation. So the Church of England gave the church to the medical school and turned to a library. That's a long and short it. Come 19, the Second World War, the place was bombed out. All the windows were blown out. And we then began to fit, put the windows back over the succeeding years. And this is the pandemic flu window. It's based on Goga. I think you can see the great, on the right-hand side, you've got the future. And this is represented in this abstract window. They're all abstracts. So the, as the white heat of science and technology. This is Harold Wilson. Uh, the, the artist, uh, uh, the sculptor, the glass artist, was very religious. And that's why there's a hand, those little things, a hands clasped in prayer. He insisted on having it in there, although I didn't want it in myself. Um, I said, the future of science, all oh, this is science, not people praying. But uh, you have to be very careful. Who, you know, obviously, people are very religious. So the future is science. That's clear in this painting. The, the middle represents just the future of Goga. Where are we going? Science will help us. Your science, my science, will help us all. And we have to be very careful with that, to, put, to push that. In the middle, the great pandemic of 1918. We're offering a medal for these people who die, who have helped each other. Nurses and doctors and people in the community, everyone helping each other. They, they found out who they were, and they were prepared to help. That's the commemorative medal. On the left-hand side, um, in, in a sense, and that shows the curve, yeah. in an even more powerful sense, the left-hand one, again, uh, represents, he wanted the, the wavering blue, the artist wanted that, again, as finding out who we are. Uh, and in that wavering blue, I see Phyllis Burns, quite frankly. I see Mark Sykes, 
uh, just to visualize too. So it is a powerful window. It's the only representative window in the world, I think, to commemorate victims of the pandemic flu. But finally, um, I want to show this painting. And it's got a special thing to say to us. Uh, it's a controversial painting. I'm not going to go into the details. We could spend all day here. I mean, it would be an interesting day. But this is Wyeth. And you, you see it. If you go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, go up the staircase. It's a moving staircase to the floor, where it normally is. Um, and the painting, it's not that big, smaller than the, this here. And you can stand there. Americans will come in. They say, look, it's Christina. And this is Wyeth painting. Painted in 1948, it was Christina's world. Now, look at Christina. There's something strange about it. She, first of all, she's not looking at the painter. He painted every, the painter's Wyeth. She's looking at a parent's house. She's got gray hairs in her hair. He's painted every hair, every hair, you know, piece of hair, every strand of hair in her head. Why is that? Wyeth has fallen in love with Christina. I don't want to get any further into it than that. Um, why is she in that pose? What's the matter with her right arm and her left thigh? Well, we think it's polio. We think Christina is crippled with polio. She's like that, and he's painted every blade of grass from Christina to the parent's house. Why is that? Well, she can't walk. Christina crawls from A to B. She's going to crawl up that hillside to her parent's house. That's what Christina's going to do. But, and here's the big but, and here's the wonderful but, Within 200 miles away, in Boston, actually, um, they had two characters, they got the Nobel Prize for it, are taking monkey kidney cells and they grown them in the laboratory. And they put polio on one weekend. They disagreed about it. They said, well, you know, polio? Who knows about polio? No. Uh, they put it on the cells. You have monkey kidney, a neurotropic human virus. Well, they did. And they came back on Monday morning. They looked at the culture. My God, this virus is growing. It's growing on a monkey kidney. And they realized then, in 1948, the pair got the Nobel Prize, they realized that you could make a vaccine. You'd grow up polio on monkey kidney, kill it, and make a vaccine. They didn't do it. Salk did it. Salk did it. It took years to do it. And that vaccine will be used now to eradicate polio. But, and here's the big but, it's not easy. It's never been easy. Uh, and they're confronting everything on the, on the final eradication of the virus. You come up against politics. You come up against war. You come up against anti-science. But we are pushing. Everyone's pushing. And I think with a fair wind, with a fair wind, we expect polio to be eradicated with the original salt inactivated vaccine. This would be a wonderful thing. There'd be no more Christinas on this planet and that would join Rinderpest and smallpox. I don't think we'll ever eradicate influenza, but if we do develop new antiviral drugs, new vaccines, universal vaccines, I think we can, we can at least begin to protect very vulnerable people in our community. Thank you very much.